Good. All right, there's that. So welcome to our, our pen ultimate wetlands, water wetlands and watershed seminar of the semester. Today, we are fortunate enough to have with us, let me see where my little windows are. Okay, so today we have with us Dr. Marcelo Ardon. Dr. Ardon is an associate professor at the Department of Forestry and Environmental Resources at North Carolina State University. His research centers on ecosystem ecology, wetland and stream biogeochemistry, the impacts of land use and climate change on the movement of water, carbon, and nutrients, and restoration strategies. His research lab aims to explain the mechanisms underlying ecosystem responses to humans' accelerated environmental change and to develop forecasts and adaptation strategies to those changes. Dr. Ardon received his bachelor's in biology in, and environmental science from Gettysburg College and his PhD in ecology from the University of Georgia. He also completed a postdoc at Duke University in biogeochemistry and uh, now doing excellent things at NC State. So Dr. Ardon, Marcelo, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. All right, thank you very much. Um, I guess, uh, David, let me know if sound is not working or something like that, but thank you it's very good. much. Audio is good, everything looks good. Okay, great. So thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's uh, unfortunate I couldn't come and be there in person. Uh, I feel like there's a lot of overlap between the kind of work that I do and a lot of the work that you guys do. Uh, so it would have been great to come down and be able to learn uh, from all of you guys, uh, but maybe we can st see this as a start of a conversation that maybe we can continue in some uh, some kind of other way. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that we've been doing in my lab, and and you know I got to start by saying that you know this is the royal we, right? Um, there we go. Um, this is work that I've been doing with students and uh, colleagues and postdocs and lots of group of people. Uh, over a number of years. These are just some photos of the uh, group members uh, over the years that I've worked with. Some of the um, collaborators, Alonso Ramirez, who's here at NC State, Kathy Pringle at UGA, Emily Bernhardt, Justin Wright, and Ryan Emanuel, who are all over at Duke, are people that I've been working. And a lot of the work um, all of the students and postdocs and colleagues have done, and then the interpretations are mine. So the errors are mine, the good work is, is all theirs. So I, I you know, in general, I, I like to talk about uh, climate change and thinking about climate change using this quote that, you know, it's like the future has already arrived, it's just not evenly distributed, right? And I think that's a good way to think about that. Often people talk about climate change as something that's gonna happen by 2100 or affecting polar bears, but I think that it's something that's happening now it's happening everywhere. Uh, it's just not evenly distributed. It's not happening everywhere. Of course, you know, certain communities and certain ecosystems tend to bear the uh, grunt of this. Um, but I, the kind of work that I do is trying to understand what these signals of climate change are we already seeing um, and how can we understand uh, those signals and those mechanisms. And so a lot of what I do is I start measuring things and then I try to keep measuring those things for as long as I can possibly can and, and, and keep it funded. And once I have these measurements, I start identifying patterns and then try to design experiments either in the lab or in the field where we can try to figure out what the mechanisms might be. Then we try to forecast what's gonna happen in the near future. And then we go back to the funding agencies and beg for money to see if we can keep that record going and try to uh, test our, our assumptions and our understanding of those mechanisms. Uh, increasingly, I also try to collaborate with people and we try to collect information from other places to try to come up with syntheses. And, and this is a paper where we uh, summarize uh, nutrient enrichment experiments that have been done all, all over the world. And so a lot of the times when we talk about climate change, right, we tend to focus on temperatures and we know that temperatures are rising. And these, this is an old figure from the IPCC just showing annual averages increases. I like the decadal averages also just showing that these are going up and that the steps are getting higher, right? And so things are changing and the rate of changing is accelerating as well, which makes it hard for these ecosystems to adapt. 
And while we know that changes in uh, temperature are very clear, changes in precipitation are not quite as clear. From basic principles, we know that if we have a warmer atmosphere, you're going to have more moisture stored in the atmosphere, right? All of you in Florida know this. We know this well in North Carolina, hot and humid during the summer. And so if we have a warmer atmosphere, more moisture should stay in the atmosphere. And so you would have longer periods without any precipitation uh, punctuated by more severe storms. And so those changes in precipitation are one of the things that I'm interested. Even though we don't really know how precipitation is gonna change in any given year, it might be that the total amount of rainfall doesn't necessarily change but the distribution of that rainfall will change. And that's gonna have consequences for streams and wetlands, which are the ecosystems that I like to study and, and focus. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about work in Costa Rica. This is where I did my dissertation and I still do work down there. Then a little bit about work here in North Carolina um, that I started as a postdoc and I'm still doing and then kind of where I'm going uh, or, or work that is coming up in, in, in the near future. So um, for climate change, we know that um, precipitation patterns and the re these regimes are likely going to change and that that seasonality is going to change. In Central America, it's likely that droughts will become more common and El Nino-like conditions are likely to become more common. And we've noticed changes in streams in Costa Rica related to El Nino, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So the work in Costa Rica that we've been doing is uh, in La Selva Biological Station. Uh, it's kind of in the northeast of, uh, of Costa Rica. You can see it down here. Um, it's at the base of a dormant volcano and a, of a protected corridor. Um, it goes from about 30 meters above sea level to about um, 1,000 meters above sea level. And we've been studying these different streams. Um, my PhD advisor, Kathy Pringle at UGA, started studying these streams in the late 80s, and we've continued studying them pretty much uh, continuously since then. And so what we've been looking at is that some of these streams receive these interbasin geothermally modified groundwater inputs. Um, these things change the chemistry of the water, but they do not change the temperature. This is different from other geothermally modified groundwater inputs that actually warm the streams. In La Selva, these uh, geothermal inputs move through really long flow paths along the volcano about 2000 years, it takes the water to move from the top down into coming out in the streams that we're studying. And so there's no change in temperature, but there's change in solutes, change in alkalinity, and also change in phosphorus. And so we spent a lot of time looking at phosphorus and that's what I did my dissertation research on. And then we've spent a lot more time recently looking at changes in pH related um, to changes in precipitation regimes. And so this is another kind of map of La Selva, just showing the, the red are the uh, streams and rivers that receive these geothermally modified groundwater inputs, and the blue are the areas that do not. And so the red have high solute, and the blue have low solutes. Um, and one of the things that we noticed early on, this is stream pH. And some of the sites, the darker sites, are the ones that receive the geothermal modified inputs, and the clear ones do not. And what we noticed is that there were pH drops, um, like particularly look at this one during the 98-99 El Nino event. And this happened in both uh, sets of streams, but it happened a lot more pronounced uh, in the streams that don't receive the geothermally modified inputs. And again, this was uh, associated with the mega ENSO event of 1998-1999. And we've had various hypotheses as to what causes this. What we think happens is that during those El Nino years, the dry season is drier and the wet season is wetter. The total amount of rainfall during the year doesn't change. But those changes in the distribution of rainfall leads to uh, the trees losing more of their leaves, uh, trees having higher root mortality, 
So overall, there's more carbon accumulated in the soils of the watershed. And then when the rains come in at the beginning of the rainy season, there's a lot of organic acids and just inorganic carbon from the breakdown of that organic matter that makes it into the stream and causes the, uh, those pH drops uh, in the streams that don't receive the geothermal modified inputs. So this was a study that Nick Mossov, who was my grad student and he was a UF alum also, um, he calculated the amount of groundwater flux, the CO2 coming in through the groundwater and noticed that the, it coincided with those drops in pH, even though there are times when the pH drops more than we would expect uh, due to that groundwater CO2 flux. We also were interested in looking at what are the consequences of these pH drops. And so we did a study where we looked at two streams, one that received these geothermally modified inputs and naturally has pHs that are very different. So the downstream section received these geothermally modified inputs and has much higher, more stable pH, and the upstream does not. You can see the pH is almost a unit lower. And then we also took a stream that does not have those and we added uh, bicarbonate to try to buffer the stream. Um, and so that's what you can see these increases in pH where we were trying to buffer the stream. You can see that we're not as good at separating the pH as the natural uh, groundwater inputs, uh, but we were able to increase the pH and decrease the variability, but the ecosystem did not seem to care that much. The, ecosystem processes. So here we were looking at breakdown rates uh, of leaf litter and all those uh, four sites, and we didn't see big differences associated with changes in uh, the pH. This has been happening for a long time, so what we think is happening is that a lot of the macrovertebrates, uh, even the microbes, might be used to these kinds of uh, fluctuating conditions. We've also been doing uh, work or synthesizing now. So at this point, we have about 23 years of uh, solute chemistry from these different streams, which gives us enough time to look at uh, the variation of El Nino years, La Nina years, and you know, no, no, just like the neutral conditions. And so here we're looking at temporal uh, CV, the coefficient of variation. Let me show you here the pH. And these are all our different sites, and some are seeps, some are the streams receiving the um, modified groundwater inputs, and some are just the streams that don't receive any of them. And you can see that the variability in the streams that don't receive the geothermal modified inputs is much higher than in the other streams. So if you're looking at this kind of riverscape, it seems to suggest that these streams receiving the groundwater inputs are much more stable, kind of nicer environments, good places for these like little kids to learn versus these streams that don't receive them are a lot more variable and precipitation drives changes in these systems uh, and, and makes it harder for, for organisms. Um, Nick was also very interested in stream metabolism and you, know, you guys have the Odom history also of metabolism. So he did a synthesis of looking at metabolism that we measured in our tropical streams and compared it to uh, temperate streams and uh, the metabolism rates seem to be overall pretty similar, even though the drivers were slightly different between them. One of the uh, things that I've been spending a lot of time thinking about is that these streams in La Selva had very high nitrate concentrations which is interesting because these are draining pristine uh, rainforest. And so there's been this idea of the, of the um, nitrogen paradox going around that a lot of tropical forests have really high nitrogen and have high frequency or high abundance of nitrogen fixing tree species. And so people have said that the high nitrogen in these streams and in these soils is uh, driven by uh, the high abundance of these nitrogen fixing trees. And so I was thinking about this and we had 21 years of stream nitri nitrate concentrations for different sites in the La Selva landscape. And I knew that other people had been measuring tree growth in nearby areas and leaf litter production. So I was interested in seeing, can we combine those data sets? And does that tell us anything about 
you know, does the growth of nitrogen fixing trees tell us anything about the nitrogen in the streams uh, draining La Selva? And what I found was that the years where there was higher growth of nitrogen fixing trees were also the years where there was higher nitrogen in the streams. Now, it's not just nitrate. I had to account for salt, uh, for um, just for the amount of water that was there, basically thinking of this as like the uh, volume weighted concentration. So when I did that, those years where the annual uh, growth of the nitrogen fixers was higher, where, the nit where also the years where nitrate concentrations were higher. And the same kind of relationship was not there if I looked at the growth of other species of trees, the species that are not that are known not to have these nitrogen fixing symbiotic relationships. So overall, we found that the identity of the trees and the location as well, I don't have time to go into that, but I found that the relationship with the nitrogen fixing trees was uh, more strong, was stronger when the trees were located in slopes nearby the streams and not in plateau higher elevation areas uh, farther away from the stream. Um, so summary for this part, groundwater inputs can buffer these tropical streams in terms of pH, but we're now finding that it seems to matter for other solutes as well. Um, changes in precipitation can change the stream pH. However, the ecosystem processes seem to be resilient to these pH drops, and these nitrogen fixers seem to be driving the stream nitrate concentrations. All right, so let me switch gears a little bit and now talk about changes in precipitation and changes in water uh, in North Carolina wetlands. And so, again, this is just to emphasize this idea that maybe overall changes in precipitation are not going to happen, but we do see changes in the distribution of that rainfall. So this is just showing changes in precipitation from 1901 to 2007, showing that summers have been turning drier in the southeast, while falls have been turning wetter. And you know, spring and winter maybe also a little bit drier in, in winter, but not as clear are these two. And so these things can drive changes in, um, in part, this is related to changes in storms, frequency and magnitude of storms, but also changes in frequency and magnitudes of drought, particularly summer drought. And for the, these coastal systems, we also have to remember that they have, they're dealing with accelerating sea level rise, which, you know, you guys are in Florida. I don't need to tell you much about that. You, you, you are seeing this as well. You're in the front lines. I also wanted to mention this paper that I just came out. I just saw it because the Washington Post did a piece on it like two days ago talking about increases in sea level rise in the Southeast and the Gulf Coast, saying that when we look at sea level rise just from 2010 to now, it could be up to 10 millimeters per year, as opposed to the like three to four millimeters when we look at longer time scales. Uh, and this probably has to do with changes in climate and changes in ocean circulation. Um, but it's really interesting to, to think that it, it's, Again, it's changing and the rate of change seems to be accelerating. So we're focusing here in North Carolina where I've been working. This red dot is the site that I'll tell you about in a minute. This dark blue are areas that have would be a underwater due to one meter of sea level rise by 2100. And as I've been working on this and talking about sea level rise, I realized that these kinds of maps are not the best way to get people engaged and thinking about sea level rise. And it makes me think of this kind of map as just like terrible things are going to happen or terrible things are going to happen more slowly. Um, we need to find better ways to talk about this and, and, and um, engage people in these changes that are coming. Um, we did a, a, a review of, of salinity in freshwater wetlands a couple of years ago, and we found uh, we were collaborating, you know, people in the U.S., people in Europe, and people in Australia. I'm sure salinization is happening in Brazil and in Africa and in India, Bangladesh, but we don't have data from those places, but I'm sure it's happening. So these kinds of things are happening all over the world. We just need uh, more studies in, in more of these different areas. 
So the work that I started doing in, in North Carolina, I started as a postdoc working with Emily Bernhardt in this restored wetland, which is a thousand hectare mitigation bank. 440 hectares of it used to be in corn and soybean agriculture. It had two constrained inflows, constrained outflow. Um, and I started looking at the water quality of the system. Of the system. And we were also looking at greenhouse gas emissions from the system. So I always like to show pictures of what it looked like, you know, in the 70s. This is probably kind of a, a Pocosin, but also like a bald cypress kind of swamp. It got turned into corn and soybean for about 20 years. Uh, then in 2004, they did the last crop. 2005 and 2006, they planted 750,000 trees across the 440 hectares. I started working on it in 2006, and I'll show you a couple of pictures of the same area as it was changing. This is probably 2008. Uh, this is probably 2011, a beaver dam came in. 2013, uh, this is probably 2014, uh, all from the same area. You can see that the trees have been growing like uh, gangbusters in part because there's that fertilizer legacy, right? From those 20 years of fertilizer applications, these soils have a lot of uh, nutrients in them. One of the first things that we noticed was that during years that we had drought, so here the water level is in the gray in the back. And so you see the water level going down, we had salt water intrusion. So this is the conductivity in three of the sites. So what happens in this area when there is drought is that the sounds get saltier because there's less fresh water pushing the salt water out. And then the salinity kind of moves in into these systems. And that salinity, that first year that we, those first two years, the salinity got pretty high, got up to about six. If you're a marine person, no units. If you're a terrestrial person, parts per thousand or practical salinity units. Whatever salinities you prefer, I always seem to get in trouble as to, to um, how I report salinity. And what we saw in those years where we had saltwater intrusion was that the wetland uh, became a nitrogen source. So most years it was a nitrogen sink, but when we had saltwater intrusion, there was release particularly of ammonium. And it happened in the soil solution and in the surface water. And it happened also in two mature wetlands that we were studying nearby, but there we only saw about a milligram of ammonium per liter, while in the restored wetland we saw up to three, and in the soil solution we saw up to 20. And so um, this is an indication that there's fertilizer legacies in these soils, and as we're having saltwater intrusion coming in, we're basically doing a landscape scale natural salt extraction from uh, these systems of that uh, fertilizer legacy. And so I always like to tell people, you know, I was studying this restored wetland where the trees were kind of growing and going gangbusters. And we thought that over time, this system is gonna look more like a mature wetland. And so we had a couple of mature wetlands nearby that we were studying thinking like, that's the end point of where the system is gonna go. But what we noticed was that our mature wetlands were dying, and in some cases there was marsh vegetation that was coming in, and in other cases there wasn't any marsh vegetation. Basically, the system was being swallowed by the ocean. And so that's what got us interested in understanding these systems, and uh, people call these ghost forests, and, and you know, it, Journalists love the, the term ghost forests. Um, I'll show you that in a little bit. Here are just some pictures of uh, the systems that I've taken over the years or some of my grad students have taken over the years. And so in the last couple of years, I've been talking a lot about ghost forests and these systems. And I think I've, I've started to influence my, my neighbor's uh, Halloween decorations. Um, and and um, I think they're tired of me talking about ghost forests. But like I said, journalists seem to love um, to talk about these systems. And, 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 and David, I think you were also part of this uh, early article about them that, that uh, the Yale um, Climate News, I think, did a couple of years ago. Um, I, just, I just wish funding agencies loved Ghost Forest as much as, as, much as journalists do. 
But some of the work that, that we've been doing is trying to apply uh, this theory of state changes, um, you know, ecosystem resilience, multiple uh, alternative stable states, and trying to understand what are the drivers of these systems and what are the consequences of these, uh, calling them regime shifts? What happens when a forested wetland turns into a marsh or when it turns into open water? What are the ecosystem services that we gain or we lose as we have these uh, regime shifts or these changes? And so one of the things that we did, we know that salinity is a big driver of these changes. So we wanted to know, well, is salinity changing in these systems? So we found as much salinity data as we can find, as, as we could get our hands on. So here's a map of the Albemarle and the Pamlico Sound, the salinity in the 1970s, the salinity in the 2010s, and how much it's changed. We saw that there's been a gradual increase in salinity, but there's also been times, particularly during drought, when we have increases in salinity, but also during storms, but depending on where the storm came, if it, if it was on the water or on land, the salinity could go up or could come down depending on that trajectory of the storms. We also know that um, as salinity is increasing in these systems, we've put a lot of ditches and drains throughout this area to help facilitate the water movement out. But what it also does is that it facilitates movement of salinity in. And we could see salinity, um, more areas becoming vulnerable to salinity due to all the ditches and drains that were put in, in, in this area. So a couple of studies did uh, different approaches to remote sensing to try to get a handle of, okay, how much ghost forest do we have in these systems? And, um, they used different methods in slightly different time periods, but they came up with similar numbers, about 167 square kilometers of new ghost forests uh, in the Albemarle Pamlico Peninsula. Another study found 193 square kilometers of forest turned into uh, shrubs or ghost forests. And to put that into perspective, Washington DC has an area of about 171 square kilometers. And this is, you know, only about 2001 to 2014. This one went a little bit further, like 85 to 2019. But still, these are significant increases in these ecosystems in a relatively short amount of time. And so we were interested, well, what happens when a forest turns into a marsh? In some places, marshes are much better at sequestering carbon than forests. And that's what Chris Kraft found in Georgia. He found that marshes were a lot better at sequestering carbon than forests. So in Georgia, it seems that a change from a forest to a marsh, if what, all you care about is carbon sequestration, it might be a good thing. Working in other places in Georgia and South Carolina, Greg Noe found the opposite. He found that the forests sequestered more carbon than the marshes. And that's similar to what we found. We found that the forests sequester more carbon than the marshes in North Carolina. Same thing with nitrogen. Chris Kraft found that the marshes did much better. Uh, Greg Noe found the opposite. We found very similar changes in terms of nitrogen. Um, so it seems that the consequences of uh, for ecosystem services of this change from a forest to a marsh depends on where you are and what kind of soils and what kind of vegetation uh, you have in, in these systems. So another thing we did was trying to calculate, well, how much carbon is in their systems? Where is it? Is it in the biomass or is it in the soil? And then looking at those carbon accumulation rates from those marshes, how long would it take the marshes to sequester that carbon if that biomass in the trees was lost. And what I found is that it could take from 200 to 600 years for these marshes to recover the carbon that's right now stored in those soils. These systems don't have that much time. So while if you just look at the carbon accumulation rate, you might think, okay, yeah, it's a good thing if a forest turns into a marsh, but it's important to remember that sea level is gonna to continue to rise and it's likely continue to accelerate. Another thing that we were interested in is we know that trees are very good at, uh, you know, exchanging gases between the atmosphere and the soil. I like this 
quote that a tree is a passage between earth and sky, right? What happens with dead trees? Are trees still that are dead, are they still good at exchanging gases between the soil and the atmosphere? And so Melinda, who did her PhD with me, was interested in this idea, you know, are these trees functioning as straws, facilitating the movement of gases between the soil and the atmosphere? Or are they functioning as corks in keeping those gases in the soil and preventing the movement of greenhouse gases generated in the soils to move out into the atmosphere? So she put out chambers in these uh, dead trees, these snags, and measure greenhouse gases. She measured CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide. She found that the um, snags do emit greenhouse gases. It's only about 25% of the soils. And I say only, but you know, 25% is a good amount. So the soils emit more, but the snags definitely emit gases as well. And they emit both, you know, all three gases, CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide. Um, but she also found that particularly for methane, as the methane moves from the pore water into the snags and out of the snags, it becomes oxidized. And we could see that in the uh, isotope of methane, the isotope signature of methane, but also in the concentrations. So that suggests that, yes, these, these uh, snags are functioning as straws. They're facilitating the movement of some of the gases, but they're also filtering out some of these gases, particularly methane. So maybe they're more like filtered straws in, that, in, that, um, in their function. Another thing we were very interested in is trying to identify early warning signals of this forest to marsh transition. And I don't have time to explain all of the things that Melinda did in order to, she used uh, remote sensing, looking at the NDVI change of these systems over time. And what she found is that once you look at the trend of the NDVI, and also the standard deviation using a running window of that NDVI, which has been used as an early warning signal before systems undergo a regime shift. When you look at the positive and the negative changes in the NDVI trend, same with the standard deviation, you can come up with these scenarios where she could characterize areas of the landscape that were stable. So the forest was green throughout the time period of the Landsat record. There were areas that were getting greener, and most of these were areas that uh, were recovering from fires. While there were areas where they were getting browner over time, and these are systems that are transitioning from a forest to a marsh, so we could detect early warning signals there. And there are others that were transitioning very slowly, so we know they're turning from a forest to a marsh, but it's happening so gradually that these early warning signals don't come up. But then what she could do is that then she can map these things onto the landscape. And this gives managers the idea, the opportunity to be like, okay, these systems are changing and are likely changing slowly. So that might be a place that we, we might want to try to prevent the change. Or maybe it's a place that it's already going that maybe we just want to facilitate the change. Maybe we want to facilitate the movement from a forest to a marsh because we want to have more marsh in that uh, particular refuge or in that particular area. So we know that ghost forests are increasing. Um, this loss of carbon when we lose these forests might not be recoverable in times that we need to prevent the uh, or to avoid the worst cases or the worst consequences of climate change. These snags do seem to facilitate the movement of uh, greenhouse gases, but they seem to function as, as filtered straws. Um, and these trajectories of change using remote sensing can open windows of opportunity for management. And they've um, trying to apply this uh, framework of resist, accept, or direct uh, change. And so now let me uh, talk a little bit about next steps or things that we're kind of currently working on. Um, so one of the things that I've been working on is, you know, we, we know these ghost forests are happening in, in North Carolina. There's been other studies that have documented across other places using remote sensing. I've been uh, playing around with the forest inventory analysis data set with a couple of colleagues uh, from the Forest Service to try to map out standing dead carbon and coarse woody debris. 
And we can see is that, you know, areas that we would expect like Louisiana, you know, parts of Florida where you are, parts of South Carolina, for sure here in North Carolina and Chesapeake Bay are hot spots of uh, standing dead carbon. And these are also uh, hot spots of uh, coarse woody debris. So trying to look at these changes uh, using the forest inventory analysis has, has um, it's been a productive way to, to look at this. Another thing that I started um, during this project was I, I started a, a citizen science project where I was asking people to take pictures of these systems and send them to us. And we started doing it using iNaturalist. So that basically gave us lots of different places. And what I wanted to do is like, well, can I focus on a couple of different places and take pictures over time of the same areas? Can we document the growth or the change of these ghost forests using citizen science. And um, I installed five of these uh, chronolog stations, which uh, people come in and it has a little uh, frame where people put their phone and take a picture and then they email it and it goes to a website that automatically builds um, the, the time lapse of the same area. One of the places where I did this was in one of the state park systems, and they really liked it. And they're like, oh, can you do more of these? And so now we have about 16 all along the coast of North Carolina. Um, you know, most of them we, some of them I installed two years ago. A lot of them we installed last summer, but we already have about 500 photos of these different places. Uh, and then the the idea is then to use them to document the change, but we're also going to start working with teachers so that teachers can use it in classroom curriculum uh, to get students to see these changes uh, as they're happening in, in real time. Another thing that we've been working on is like, well, okay, so it gets a little bit depressing after a while looking at ghost forests and these ecosystems dying, right? And so we've been looking at uh, restoration of these systems as a way to um, combat climate change. And so a uh, collaboration that I started a while ago with the Nature Conservancy and the US Fish and Wildlife and also USGS, where they were doing restoration of these Pocosin wetlands. Pocosins are these uh, shrub bug wetlands. Um, you guys know about wetlands, so I don't have to explain that too much. Um, but what they did is they they installed these water control structures and built a berm to increase the groundwater table in these systems that had been ditched and drained, right? Most of this area had been ditched and drained. And so the water table was artificially low. And by raising the water table, what we found is that the CO2 emissions decreased by 58%. So this is CO2 before restoration, and this is post-restoration. This is our control that you know is drained and hasn't changed. And the American Carbon Registry has a methodology by which you can document this change and that creates carbon credits that then can be sold in you know what are now voluntary carbon market markets with the idea that this can uh, raise funds to create to help um, fund restoration in other areas. And so this project was in Pocosin Lakes Wildlife Refuge, and that one has already concluded, but now we're doing another project at the Hoffman Forest, which is a property owned by NC State, where we're doing the planning stages at this point. We're collecting data now to figure out, could we do this here? What would it look like? What would it cost? And how many carbon credits could it potentially generate? Because for the Hoffman, you know, a big part of it is uh, uh, um, is pine plantation, so there's got to be financial incentives in order for them to to actually do um, the restoration. Another thing that I'm working on related to these nature-based solutions, also looking at this in the in the Hoffman Forest, is this idea of a water farm. And so the idea is similar to what they did in that restoration where they build a berm and put water control structures. We want to do something like that, but in pine plantations. And so the idea is like, we'll take two pan plantations. Uh, these are all about 12 year olds. And um, we're going to build a berm and put water control structures in one of them. And the other one will leave it as is. 
And so after storms, you know, hurricanes or any storm, what we'll do is we'll hold the water on the land just for a couple of days, two to three days, so that what we can uh, so that we can flatten that discharge curve downstream so that we can prevent flooding downstream. Um, but then we would release that water slowly. And so we would measure the water quality, we'll measure the tree growth because we want to be able to do this and document that there wouldn't be any impacts on the trees themselves so that people could do it in other places. And the idea of these is that, you know, these would be small systems, right? What we would be building is about a two foot berm. So there would be small distributed systems that could be done in many different places so that if one of these systems fails, it won't be catastrophic. It won't be a huge kind of, you know, levy failing in New Orleans, but by having many of these over, you know, the thousands and thousands of uh, acres of forest of pine plantations that we have in North Carolina and Florida all over the Southeast. The idea would be that these systems could help alleviate flooding. Um, and who knows, maybe at some point we're gonna have water markets, right? Where if people put these kinds of things and hold the water, the people downstream could pay for holding the water and prevent flooding in, the, in these areas. So we have funding from the uh, the, it's the Water Trust Fund here in North Carolina to install one of these and study it over the next three years uh, to document and, and particularly document that there are gonna be changes in the soils or changes in the trees so that people could do this and still be um, financially, um, that it would still make financial sense. Um, and I think that's all I have for today. Uh, I wanted to make sure I would have time for questions and 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 hear ideas or suggestions you might have of of some of the the work that I presented. Great, thank you, Marcelo. Let's give Dr. Ardon a round of applause, either virtual or in real life. Thanks a lot. So uh, we have a lot of folks on Zoom. We got a lot of uh, people transitioning from the YouTube over to the Zoom, so that's great. Let's start with a, a question, if we can, from our Zoom audience. We have a question for Dr. Aron. I know it takes a minute to get everyone warmed up, so we'll let you warm it up. All right, well, then I'm going to have to jump in and say <clears throat> there's a lot to choose from. There's like a, a great variety of projects with, you know, previous and uh, in, into the future. So one thing that was really intriguing was this idea, and I know um, I know Melinda's online, but this idea of NDVI change in magnitude and change in variance and that there are these quadrants. And I love this idea that there's a map that comes out of it. <clears throat> and the thing uh, I have some tried to do similar things like this with students in, in the Amazon and other places looking for tipping points and an issue is that the remote sensing data is often so variable that, yeah, we can do a good job saying variance goes up or down, but saying whether that is a significant up or down and particularly in the trend, saying whether the trend is positive or negative, we get a lot of, eh, not so much. So when I saw your map, you had four beautiful colors, each one up, up, down, down, up, down and down, up. And I, so may, can you comment on the statistical power of that? Yeah, so that's yeah. a great great question. And, 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 you know, maybe we can bring Melinda on here as well, right? So, yeah, so it's yeah. definitely this idea of using these trends, right? And, and um, the increasing standard deviation is one of those things that has been used as an early warning signal, right? Before those, those regime shifts. And you're absolutely right that there's so much variability in the remote sensing data that basically what Melinda found with, with that whole landscape is that only in about a quarter of, you know, only like 25% of the uh, landscape could you actually detect those. Um, and so the idea was like, well, just using or just trying to um, rely on those early warning signals, it doesn't, it seems like we're losing so much information. 
And so by using just this positive of negative trend, and there when I'm saying just positive or negative trend, we're using the Kendall tau of those uh, metrics. And that's how we just separate it in, into positive or negative. Um, and then the same thing with the standard deviation using the Kendall tau using po positive or negative values, then we don't lose as much information. And by putting these interpretations, okay, these systems, you know, it makes sense. These systems that are recovering, it's like they're having, they're getting greener and the variability might still be up, but it's because they're recovering, right? right. And so that way we're not as constrained as, you know, just this early warning signal approach. And it's still, I think, valuable and helpful for managers to use that kind of information. Okay, great, thanks. So um, any other questions from the Zoom room? I know uh, we often get questions from our other hosts there, Dr. Clark or Dr. Brown. Here, I have a question. A question um, from the room, go ahead. So back to when you were looking into the, <clears throat> the swamp turning into marsh from the farmland that you were analyzing, I know that in a lot of like cleared old growth cypress, like restoration things, the ecosystem that develops is much more diverse because of the increased like sun that they get because of the cypress not being there anymore. In your restoration project, are you looking to develop another like old growth cypress swamp? Or are you trying to like go into just a, a diverse ecosystem that's being developed due to just a complete restart of the environment? Yeah, that's a good yeah. question. So I, I think that was a private wetland mitigation bank, right? So they already had kind of the plan of what the restoration was going to look like so that they could meet the criteria that they needed to meet so that they could get the credits and sell the credits, right? So what we were doing was more of like, what is happening What's what are the water quality benefits? We also looked at the greenhouse gas emissions from it. So we didn't have as much input as to, you know, for example, what species they planted. So they planted species with this idea that for the low elevation, there were more like bald cypress was the most common, but some other water loving species, the higher elevations, they had other uh, slightly species with this idea of going back to what we think used to be there. But to your point, I do think that increasingly we're gonna to have to do restoration that tends to look forward because this idea that we can go back to what used to be there when we have changing precipitation regimes, changing salinity, it's gonna become less and less realistic. And we're just, you know, there's already a lot of failure in restoration that's likely going to become even worse. And then I'll also wondering back to the nitrogen fixing trees. I know there's the correlation between the nitrogen fixing trees and then their growth, but the increased um, correlation with that. But then, so then what is the correlation between the nitrogen, uh, the increased nitrogen in the rivers and the environment around it? So like, is there an association with that with the El Nino La Nina cycle or precipitation, or is that just um, more random? Well, so there's there is so the years where the trees grew most, the nitrogen fixing trees grew more, were also years that tended to be wetter, but were not the wettest years, if that makes sense. So when I plot growth of trees versus precipitation, it goes up to a point and then it starts coming down. The wettest years, the growth of trees seem to go down as well. Um, so again, that also gets to this point of like, if we have more extreme events, you know, if we have more rainfall, it seems like the trees like it up to a point and then it starts going down. So that's why, those years where there was highest growth and more nitrogen were wet years, but were not the wettest years. And they were not uh, La Nina years either. But yeah, that, that's a good question. All right, thanks everyone. So uh, we're, we're at the end of our time. So appreciate you all being here. One more round of applause for Dr. Arnone. Very much appreciate it.
We have one more presentation this semester, I think just one more. We have Dr. Krista Court. She's going to be talking about, I believe, the economic impacts of what's well, either of red tide or of Hurricane Ian. I'm not sure, but water related economic changes in Florida, many of which are, uh, you know, coming down the line. So great to see you all and um, be safe out there. Take care of each other. We'll see you all next week.